Okay, we are now recording. Great, thank you, Stephanie. And welcome everybody uh, to the June 23rd, 2023 meeting of the Town of Amherst Solar uh, Bylaw Working Group. Um, thanks for being here. Um, and um, let me just check. I know Laura is, um, I think, somewhere in D.C. airports, um, trying to make her way back through thunderstorms there, um, and may join us later, may not be able to join us, depending on flights. Uh, are we missing anybody else? No. Okay, great. Dan, um, but sorry. I think yeah, Dan. Yeah, he Dan. might not be available today. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, okay. And um, the first order of business. Oh, is the, oh, good. Yep. First order of business is the minute taker today, uh, which we went a bit out of order. Uh, so we're reverting back to Jack, if you're so able and willing today. Jack, are you okay for the minutes? Um, uh, I, I don't, um, I'm not going to do a good job at it. I'm kind of like not uh, up to par. Um, Stephanie knows. Okay. Um, it would be a huge, it'd be a huge struggle uh, for me. Okay. To, okay. to do it, quite frankly. Um, personal situation. Yep. No worries. No worries. Um, uh, uh, okay, that takes us to Laura, who's obviously not here. Uh, so then it would next in order would be back to the top of the list that we started. Hey, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne, I'm here. I can do next week, but I'm I'm not going to stay for the full meeting today. Exactly. Okay. Okay, uh, Laura. Good. Uh, good that you can join us. Um, and um, so that brings us to uh, to Bob. If you're is Bob here? Yeah, uh, Bob. Are you able to take minutes today? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So I'll make note of that. And um, then Laura, you'll be on deck next next week. Okay. Great. Okay. So uh, looking at the agenda to set the stage for today, uh, we'll have two sets of minutes. Uh, if we can to review and approve, we'll have our normal staff updates, committee updates. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time to really uh, go through language of the bylaw today. Uh, obviously, that will be our primary task moving forward after today, in my mind, uh, given the uh, summer and the end of the summer deadline, essentially. Um, but um, um, Chris will. Uh, give us a bit of an uh, an overview of where we stand and where we need to, need to be uh, need to get to uh, to sort of get us all on board and ready to dig into the bylaws uh, after after this meeting. Um, the main topic or a main topic segment today, uh, and we're on a schedule here with uh, availability of of Mark Warner, the GIS um, uh, expert uh, for the town, uh, will be providing an, an introduction overview of the of the uh, solar mapping tool uh, with additional layers uh, associated with it uh, and we'll all have an opportunity to to um, get an understanding of of what he's been able to put together for us um, as a tool uh, and, and use that for some some um, discussion and analysis uh, and then that, that'll be at, at a sharp uh, start at 1215 um, and he has a uh, a cutoff at 115. So that'll be the, an hour. Um, and then um, we'll end the meeting with some uh, 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 quick agenda items uh, and then open for public comments. All right. Okay, great. Um, so first order of business, uh, if people have had a chance to review um, the minutes from last week, sorry, last meeting and the meeting before that one, uh, May 26th and then 6-9, June 9th. Um, any comments, discussion on 
let's first take up the May 26th minutes. Um, or do I hear a motion to accept those minutes? Um, and I'm the one thing we're missing, I think, I don't know exactly who, who, who I have in my notes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So those were from Janet. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, I think I forgot to sign them. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I'll make a motion to accept my minutes from May 26, okay. 2020. I don't think there's a problem with that. Okay. Like a shyness in the crowd, but yeah. I'll set it. Okay, we have Martha second. So okay. Okay, and by voice vote, Breger? Yes. Jemsek. Uh I'm I'm pulling I'm uh I'm gonna abstain. Okay. Corcoran? Yes. Hanner? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Okay, the minutes are approved. All right, thank you. And then we had, uh, I, I would say, somewhat abbreviated minutes from our last meeting, which was uh, essentially the uh, educational program on agrivoltaics from our three speakers. Uh, the minutes really just reflect that we had that presentation and that those are available. Uh, and a few other minor things, but um, any thoughts or comments or motion on the minutes from June 9th? Janet. So I I thought we weren't going to do minutes in that meeting, and I was ruining that because it was such an informative meeting. And then when you did those minutes, I almost rude that because they don't really comply with the open meeting law requirement that somebody who didn't attend the meeting could get the gist of what happened. And so I wonder if you could just bulk them up a little bit. I don't think it's enough just to reference um, the presentations because there was so much information that came out during it. And so, you know, the lawyer in me and just, you know, the members of the public who give them access. And frankly, actually, I go back and read old minutes all the time, not every day but it's very useful to me to go back and see that you know compared to my you know checkered notes so i wonder if join if you could just put some more flesh on those bones um i mean i know it's asking for more yeah. um any other comments on that I, i'm not um yeah i have a i have a i have a comment so i'm not sure my understanding was because when people present and i'm taking notes um, I thought the minutes were supposed to be just sort of high level, but the recordings are where you get like all of the meat. Cause I think it's really difficult to take, at least in my experience, to take detailed notes when someone's presenting a lot of information really quickly. Um, I don't know, Dwayne, you, you uh, have a better understanding of what the minutes should represent, but that would be good to know if I'm, if I'm taking minutes and, um, there's a presenter, like for example, Bob today. Um, it's a lot of fast typing. Yeah, my my thought, and maybe Stephanie could um, uh, let her uh, let her know her thoughts. But uh, was that um, minutes on a external speaker speaking to PowerPoint slides? Was um, uh, I'm not. Sure. It seems like there's a much better record of that with their PowerPoint slides and the and the recording. Than trying to take notes and and interpret what they said, external uh, presenters. So I was a little bit. Uh, I was thinking that it would be more appropriate to post their slides um, and the recording, and not necessarily try to um, transcribe or even um, try to summarize their speak their uh, their talking points. So um, how we deal with it is that actually. A lot of committees deal with their minutes differently. However, um, we have had committees, and I have um, actually done this for the Conservation Commission, which has very detailed, um, even legal proceedings, um, summar just sort of summarized the gist of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And then really what you have to have are the votes. If there are any votes that occur, those have to be actually recorded. But I don't think to because you had the presentation, you had the slides in the packet, they are available to the public. Um, you also have the meeting recording. I really don't know that you have to get into 
detail about each speaker. So I, I just think it's maybe unnecessary work for Dwayne at this time. I, I think he doesn't really have to do that. That's my take. And maybe Chris has a different opinion, but that's, I think a summary is fine because it wasn't a legal proceeding or anything. And there were no votes taken. It was just basically presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to say something about that? If you, if you have anything to say. Um, I agree with Stephanie. Um, the only thing I would say is if members of the group happened to say things that were really important um, before or after those presentations, that you might want to include some of the uh, comments from the working group. But, um, you know, other than that, I think that presentations stand on their own. I did happen to watch the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I found it very informative and other people could do the same. So I don't really feel like you need a word to word for word transcription of what happened then there. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments or thoughts on that? Is that a hand, Martha? Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> a, hand. a real hand. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, let me say that Art Keen did kind of a good summary. He put it in the end with Indy. He had attended and listened to the thing. Um, and I don't know, I I, I agree in, in general. Uh, I don't think that Jake Marley really included all his slides. I think he just, the, all I saw was just four, not really his, his talk. So I don't know, the only possible compromise might be to take say, you know, two sentences about each that, you know, like Jerry Palamo really, you know, carefully reviewed all the smart uh, things and his slides are fairly complete and go reference them or, you know, Jake, uh, a description of a sentence or two about who he is and what he did, what he does. Um, you know, that would be my only suggestion, but I wouldn't feel it was really necessary. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Janet, yeah. You're muted. I do think we need more detail without a transcript. And so it's um, the fact that somebody's not a member of the committee providing information doesn't really say, like, oh, someone can, yeah. like, watching the video isn't an answer to open meeting law. There's no provision that says, oh, you can, you have a four hour meeting, everyone can watch that. Cause obviously people, the whole point of open meeting laws to help the public participate and understand without burdening them with what we do <laughs> and the length of it. So I would put some more information in. Jake had a lot to say, but you know, we had a lot of questions and comments too. And I think that um, something in between a transcript and a sentence or two has to be provided. And so, you know, that's just the law. And, you know, I know Jack and I have gone back and forth on, on this in two committees, but there's, it's just too thin and people just, and it's also great information too. So anyway, so that's my comment. All right. Um, Jack. Yeah. Uh, did we discuss about um, just including the slides? Do we have the slides from each of the presenters? Well, the, the slides are available on the website. Um, are you suggesting somehow incorporating them in the minutes? Yeah, just by, by reference. And I think we'd be all set, you know, wouldn't we? I was just going to offer to um, Dwayne, I'll work on them. And okay. I'll add the link to the slides. And I won't, I'm not going to wax lyrical um, because it's not meant to be a transcript. It's just meant to be a summary. So I don't think we need to have all the detail, but I will. Um, I will work on them a little more and you can vote on them at the next meeting if that works for people. Yes. Thank you. Yep, I think that's good. Okay, and, and extremely appreciated, Stephanie. Sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we'll postpone that till next meeting. Okay. Um, all right, uh, staff updates, Stephanie? Um, if you have um, the only real update I think I have is just, um, Right now we're collecting public comment for the community choice aggregation. So if people haven't submitted their support, um, we would love for you to please send an email um, to me. You could either send an email directly to me and just sort of state your simple support. It doesn't have to be anything 
in great detail um, for the community choice aggregation. The comment period ends on the 30th, so you have a week left to get comment to me. And so far we've had quite a bit. In fact, the consultants have said that we've received the most comment than any of their other aggregations. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, great. Okay, which shouldn't uh, um, dissuade anybody from adding adding to the pile, uh, yes. for sure. So, okay. right. awesome, good to hear, Stephanie. Um, I thought I saw a hand, but okay, uh, Martha. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, you had we, there was also the discussion at the ECAC this week about the um, expanded stretch code, and people were being asked to uh, let their town councilors know before the Monday meeting? Is that anything you'd wanted to mention? or I don't think that they were asking people. I think they were just talking amongst the committee members. I don't think they were looking for the general public to provide comment um, okay. because that will be a process that will go through the town council. So people will have opportunity as they're weighing that decision about whether to recommend or adopt the specialized code. But yes, that will be before the council. And I think it will be on Monday. So that might be something folks are interested in. And the specialized stretch code is just an expanded, uh, an expansion, further expansion of the stretch energy code. All right, great. Um, Janet. I have a quick question. Does that, is there gonna be a requirement of like putting panels on new buildings? or you know using heat pumps or any is it does it is a new stretch code more sort of forcing you into solar or i think the idea is that when buildings are new construction would be solar ready or have solar okay for this that's for the moving in towards the specialized code i believe that's one of the differences great okay any um Chris, anything on your end in terms of staff updates? Um, I I don't think I told you that the battery storage facility at 515 Sunderland Road was approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals. That happened on the 25th of um, May. Um, so I thought you might be interested in knowing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I've also asked one of our staff people, uh, Rob Wachilla, who um, helped to draft the battery storage bylaw in where um, I've asked him to take a crack at uh, drafting a battery storage bylaw for us. So that may be coming along in the next few months. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any uh, committee updates uh, for many of us who liaise with committees? I have Zippo from the planning board. Okay. Um, all right. And um, yeah, from ECAC, uh, uh, I think um, Stephanie mentioned from the ECAC meeting also, we, we talked about the uh, um, uh, Valley Green Energy. Um, ECAC is also putting um, drafting now, uh, trying to final finalize a draft of its annual report, which should be available uh, in another few weeks or meetings, I guess, until we get that approved. Um, and I think that's it from uh, ECAC. Okay, anybody else? All right, great. Uh, so we thought we could spend um, maybe about uh, 10 minutes or so and then move over, move to Chris on on the where we stand with the bylaws. But just a a, a, a little bit of a discussion um, on the debriefing from our discussion on agrivoltaics um, last meeting. Um, I, I I agree. I think I thought, uh, all three presenters presented useful and different information from each other, um, and. Um, um, uh, and I'm interested in in uh, hearing what people have have to uh, think from that. Um, I guess what I a couple of things um, uh, just to, to point out. One is um, um, I want to be uh, careful uh, or or sort of differentiate between 
what I would consider more zoning bylaw, zoning regulations and program regulations on agrivoltaics that DOER runs. Uh, and and uh, um, uh, I, we learned a lot about agrivoltaics both na uh, nationally, but specifically in Massachusetts. Um, I think the sense that I know, um, and I think that we got from the speakers is that Massachusetts is um, has very rigorous standards uh, and re regulatory requirements to be eligible for agrivoltaics as the state defines it for the purpose of smart incentives. Um, very different from agrivoltaics as defined more generally across the country. Um, and, um, uh, you know, one thing we have to think about in terms of how we zone or, or develop bylaws for, for uh, uh, agrivoltaics um, is uh, how much do we just simply rely on the state uh, and their rules and regulations with regard to, uh, to, to um, ag the design of agrivoltaics and the requirements of agrivoltaics, re recognizing that um, those those are we know what they are today we don't know what they will necessarily be in 10 years and to some extent i think these zoning rules should be somewhat uh, evergreen if you will uh uh um so that's 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 an issue um um but um any 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 uh let me let me hear from anybody else in terms of the we don't want to start digging into the rules right now we'll get to drafting some of this uh, in due time, uh, but thoughts on the presentations and the information and questions that uh, it raised. Uh, um, Martha, you sent some questions. Uh, yeah. I do wanna pick up on on Laura's follow-up email. I, and Stephanie, if, if you wanna opine on this. Um, again, I think the protocol is really that um, we don't email the whole group together. Uh, but that um, that type of email goes to Stephanie and or myself uh, for dissemination to the group uh, yeah. just moving forward. Yeah, well, I, I felt that I wasn't saying any opinion at all, that I was just listing things that were, you know, objective questions. That's why I felt it was OK. But yeah, but I, I would be interested to hearing from each one of us as to what was each person's sort of main takeaway from it all or, or sort of main impression uh, f from it all. I mean, I guess from my side, I was most impressed with, with Jake's presentation and the, and the kind of the complexity and the, and the detailed care that has to go into each application on, in order to make it work. So that was my sort of main takeaway. Anyone else to? Go ahead, Janet. Um, I was, I'm always, I'm, I'm struck, I was struck by the complexity of the whole situation and the uncertainty. And, you know, how do you, um, you know, you know, what are your goals? Like if your goal is to keep land in production and what level of production and how do we regulate that <clears throat> or monitor that when nobody knows what works in Massachusetts? And so, um, you know, we have like, you know, UMass like Clean Energy Extension is doing, you know, four experimental things to see like what works in mass and how far apart and, you know, angles and all that good stuff and what plants are doing well. With also the, you know, it has to be multi-year because plants, you know, obviously do well different years and different conditions. And so, um, so given the uncertainty, does dual use using work in mass and how what's the best way to work? What do you do? Like, what do we do in Amherst saying, okay, you know, we want to require dual use, um, but how do you how do you do that in uncertainty? And then, you know, like Dwayne's program is also giving people advice. Um for how to do dual use in this face of this uncertainty. And so um, that makes me nervous and I'm concerned about like, so what if the requirement doesn't work? What if the, the farm situation isn't good, but the, all the, all the um, solar arrays are in there. And so, and you know, my understanding is that no one's gonna be pulling solar arrays out in 30 years. I mean, I just, I don't think the climate crisis will be over. And I think when you have a huge investment like that, 
and you're making money, it's, and it makes sense just to continue. So whatever we decide, these facilities are, I would consider them permanent. And so how do we get the energy off the solar array and how do we keep those the, the land in production? Um, so I just, I was just struck by the uncertainty of it. Go ahead, Jack. Um, yeah, I was um, definitely encouraged by, uh, you know, the success of these dual use uh, situations and was struck favorably how it actually um, allows reclamation in effect of a lot of fields that probably wouldn't even be farmed because irrigation needs or just not favorable conditions. And it seemed like dual use actually expanded uh, the opportunity for agricultural uh, work in certain you know locations. And then where farming uh, is already you know productive, it just provided a kind of different lens in terms of of what type of uh, production would be you know occur there. But it seemed very friendly to agricultural you know activities. Uh, I have no reservations uh, about dual use whatsoever. I mean, from from that presentation, that that was my takeaway. I mean, and it provided you know the the farmers income that they could invest into uh, appurtenances and uh, and similar, you know, uh, like irrigation uh, and you know other features that they need in the farm. The the solar would actually help pay for. So uh, it's it's a win-win for me for all this. Great. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I mean, I just for, for myself, I would tend to, um, uh, um, my takeaways that I, I, I think there is um, a great deal of care that's being taken, um, or at least from, uh, from, from Jake's perspective, from AFT's perspective, uh, between the solar developers and the farmers to come up with a plan that um, that is um, um, designed to work for the farm, um, I do know in the in the in our review of dual use applications, um, we always look for what is Plan B. <clears throat> if the if the first crop <clears throat> or agricultural pr uh, practice that they're uh, planning to do, if that actually doesn't work. Uh, too well, uh, unexpectedly less than, than anticipated. What is there? Is the is the array designed in a way, and the farm field laid out in a way that allows for a plan B uh, for another form of agriculture to to uh, be tried out? Um, and um, you know, I guess there's always the situation, and we this uncertainty is not going to evaporate anytime soon, um, as, as mentioned. Uh, so there is always this situation of developing policy in some under some degree of uncertainty um and um so i wouldn't i wouldn't think that was is a reason not to to push forward um i would also say that um uh i am i do recognize from aft particularly uh of the opportunity for uh agrivoltaics to actually to be helpful in keeping some farm field in some situations in agriculture uh, as opposed to um, uh, potentially being left unfarmed or or uh, sold off for other purposes. Uh, so there's, those are all issues. Um, let me um, uh, let, let, let me hear from uh, uh, Chris and then Laura and then Janet and then we'll we'll uh, think about moving forward. I, I see Mike has joined us, but yeah. I, I wondered if um, there was uh, any resource where we could find out about success of dual use in Europe. It seems like it's being more, there's more being done in Europe. And how can we find out about that? That was something that was brought up in one of the presentations. And that made me really curious and interested. Sure. Um, yeah, I can look into that a bit, see if there's any um any reports on that um, uh, um, that I can um, find from some of the resources I have. Okay, uh, Laura. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, I think across the board here, we're all 
um, supportive of agrivoltaics. I am, you know, it's been something that I've definitely been tracking for years. Um, I think there also needs to be the recognition that it's it's still challenging. You know, it's a it's still nascent, and um, even when you have incentives like Massachusetts does in New York, if they don't already, I know they're in the process of developing. Um, it's still really challenging. Um, so I, you know, I suggest that in our in our language, if there's any way to come out in strong support of agrivoltaics, um, but I, I think we need to, you know, I'm not sure, you know, because right now any developer, they get, if it makes economic sense and they feel like they can do it, um, they will. The only thing I'm thinking about that would be helpful to developers that this group might add value to is that because a lot of the developers are not based in our area, they're based in Boston, for example, like a, a Nexamp or a Blue Wave, if the town has the ability to refer them, like even maybe Dwayne Year Group to a center that can help guide them on how to do agrivoltaics in our region, um, that is something that has not been done um, to my knowledge. And um, so, for example, you know, you're developing a project in Amherst, it's really hard as it is, like that's kind of the last thing they're thinking about because of how difficult it is just to even find a site, get interconnection that works and there's not millions of dollars permitting all the things that it takes to get a project developed. Um, and if it was, if, if we made it easier for them in some way to advance our goals by giving them a list of references, that would be, I think, incredible. Um, but I think we need to, you know, aside from supporting it, my my opinion is it's not our place to get involved in the regulation or the monitoring of agrivoltaics because one of the reasons why developers aren't doing it in Massachusetts is that there are such stringent regulations. Um, and uh, and I think a lot of them don't feel comfortable committing to it and then not being able to deliver. So if there's a way we can help them deliver, that would be very valuable. But I also want to reiterate um, Janet's point about, you know, I think it's highly unlikely, like we need to look at it this the lens of once someone, like right now, solar and storage is a technology, but 20, 30 years from now, who knows what the technology is going to be? You know, everyone's racing to get solutions for climate change and the technology just keeps improving dramatically. Even solar, you know, efficiency proved, improved by 70% over the past 15 years. Um, so it's unlikely that you're going to have a site that was developed for any sort of energy production that all of a sudden goes back to farmland. So, um, you know, I think we need to recognize that as well. Um, and I think it's all the more reason to support a dual use situation. So. Super. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> all right. Uh, Janet, one last comment and then we'll um, go to Chris. Yep. So um, thank you, Laura. I So I would, I, so I, someone sent me a thing about in Lenox, um, there's a company whose name I can't remember, TLH Vineyard Sky or something. And they are, they have a 45 acre project on Hayfield. Um, they bought the Hayfield from a farmer who's hated it. And um, they're putting 20, they're proposing like a $21 million array and their far, and their, their farming operation is 12 sheep. And, and then they're also putting in a shed for the sheep. And so you know, it, so I kept on thinking of the just sheep and, you know, and obviously this is not a real farm operation um, or a serious one when you think about the number of sheep down the road in Hadley. And so I think that's like, that's another concern I had after someone sent me this article and I called the Lennox planning director and just had a long conversation because she also sits on her planning board in her town next door. And so this whole question about, you know, like, it just to like the agrovoltaics and you know how it's regulated and I was going to send her stuff from the state and things like that so I think we have to kind of look at the question of just sheep and how many sheep and so and I also like you know with in terms of just relying on the state regulations it's kind of a political decision they're always making and it's shifting and you know we could put in requirements and that you know we think will protect the land and prevent just 12 sheep being a farming operation um or you know, requiring that soil be analyzed and all the good things that was recommended by the engineer. Um, and then if the state shifts later to weaker regulations, we have our good Amherst ones, or if they get you know more advanced regulations, we could also shift with that too. So I wouldn't step away from um, a town role 
um, just the way we have our own wetlands regulations and we have the state wetlands act. And I think we have to sort of address the, you know, issue of like someone's, you know, Brookfield farm has like 40 acres and is feeding like 400 families. And so what if, you know, and obviously this is APR land, but difference, but what if a person, you know, farmers, you know, basically said, I grow vegetables, I've sold my solar field, you know, 200 sheep come in. Do we want that to happen? Is there some way of controlling that? Um, I also don't think the state's going to have great oversight of these um, farm operations and if they exist. And so, you know, at least we're closer to the ground or the town can say, yeah, this is great. He had, you know, 200 ca cattle and now he's down to seven. That's not working anymore. And, you know, I think we should, you know, we, we, we should sort of keep a role in that. Um, okay. <clears throat> Thanks for that. And Laura, I'm not sure if you have your, your hand up again or I do, I do. I yeah, do. Okay, um, mm -hmm. Just just a quick counterpoint to Janet's. Um, I mean, I listen, I think um, the reason why people aren't doing agrivoltaics. So, for example, there are a lot of different adders in Massachusetts. So you get a big adder if you subscribe low income customers, for example. It's probably one of the larger adders. But in order to do that, you can't just say the state doesn't say, OK, Mr. Project Owner, I trust that you are offering discounted power to low income subscribers, they're validating it. And I think um, the main reason why we're not seeing more agrivoltaics is because developers are concerned about the ongoing requirements to verify. Because what happens is if you if you get that credit for agrivoltaics and you don't adhere to it, it gets clawed back. It's it's like a it's a really big deal because you're underwriting a project and then it gets clawed back. So it's not it's certainly not taken lightly so i'll put it that way you know you're not going to put three sheep on and say this counts because um it has major um economic implications um but i think you know i i have never and i am not as i haven't read through any updated language to the state but the only time i see sheep on solar farms they have voracious appetites and i only see them used for um like um, O and M, ongoing uh, operations and maintenance to keep the grass low and the weeds out, um, but they have to be rotated a lot. So I just did a project in Hawaii where this guy has literally four thousand sheep, and he moves them around to giant utility scale farms, and that's how he how they maintain an environmentally sustainable way of maintaining, um, you know, grass mowing um, across. You know, it's a business for him. I think sort of like the lower level here, um, I, I worked with a developer in Maryland who I'd love to put you guys in touch with because they are um, philosophically, they're not in Maryland, they've done projects in Maryland, they're based in the uh, Seattle area, but they're philosophically aligned with what we're trying to do. They always try to incorporate agrivoltaics and at the very sort of bare bones level, I think it must've been seven years ago when there wasn't even an incentive in Maryland, they had pollinator facilities, they were raising bees on all of their sites um, because, because, they, because it was important to them, basically. And they, these were community solar projects in Maryland. The company's called One Energy Renewables and they're a great group of people. Um, but anyway, so I think like, you know, pollinator habitat, I don't think you get credit from the state there, but um, it's definitely a, you know, important thing to do, especially when, um, you know, our pollinators are at risk, so. Thank you, Laura. Okay, and just uh, just to be clear, for at least in Massachusetts, I mean, uh, bringing in sheep to to keep the grass low um, would not be defined as agriculture for agrivoltaics, um, uh, so that wouldn't get the adder. Uh, but sheep may may serve a very good purpose for normal ground mounted solar arrays uh, to keep the grass low, um, and also uh, just pollinator pollinator habitat. Uh, did get a very small adder, but that's been con um, that's still um, being being worked out. The DPU took it away, and and now DOER is trying to get it back. Okay, um, we have um, Mike Warner has joined us, um, but I, um, Chris, do you want to just give us a, a brief um, sort of status or or update of sort of where we stand with the bylaw, and sort of just to set us up for where we're going to be going. Uh, with drafting after this meeting? Sure. Um, I sent a, a list. Um, it was an updated version of the outline to Stephanie. I don't know if she's able to 
pull it up or not. But um, while she's working on that, I would say that since the last time I met with this group, which I think was on May 12th, um, I've spent time listening to the two solar bio working group meetings that I missed, May 26th and June 9th. Um, and in addition, I've uh, reviewed all of the sections that we've written to date, and they are pretty inclusive. Um, but there are some things that we need to think more about as we go forward. And one of them is how to deal with farmland and whether we're going to require um, the use of agrivoltaics on farmland if solar arrays are going to be installed or not. And um, another thing is uh, how to regulate solar on forest land. So those are two things that we haven't really addressed. We had started to address forest land a bit by saying, um, that uh, you would need to mitigate for cleared land um, in either Amherst or in an adjacent town. So, you know, we started to talk about that, but we haven't really dealt with that very, um, very clearly. Um, the other thing we need to think about is how do we want to regulate these facilities? And Currently, um, solar facilities are regulated under a certain section of the zoning bylaw about um, power generation and transformers and things like that. So pretty much across the board, except in one or two zoning districts, um, a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals is required. So we need to think about, do we want to uh, keep that requirement of having a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals, or are there certain zones where we think that um, these large-scale ground-mounted solar arrays could be um, regulated by the Planning Board by Site Plan Review? So that's something to um, think about in the next uh, you know, iteration. The other thing I wanted to um, suggest that we tackle at some point is how specific do we want to get in regulations about solar arrays on farmland? And I think um, Janet, you know, sounds like she's of the opinion that Amherst needs to have a lot of um, detailed regulations in our zoning bylaw <clears throat> to regulate solar arrays on farmland. Um, another approach would be to refer to the state regulations. And I did read those um, ASTGU guidelines this morning that Stephanie sent out that were dated June 16th. And those seem uh, pretty detailed and they seem to um, sort of track the um, criteria that uh, Janet had sent out a couple of weeks ago from someone named Kip. Um, so, uh, you know, the question is, do we really need to get that detailed with regard to what we want to do in Amherst or can we just refer to what the state is uh, recommending? Um, uh, the, another question I had is uh, for for solar on farmland, are we going to say that it has to be dual use? Um, what if a farmer has a big farm and wants to have a portion of his farm in farming, purely farming, and another portion of his farm in solar array? Is that going to be um, allowed? And if so, is there uh, some sort of ratio that we're going to say if you have X number of acres in solar array, then you have, then you need to have X number of acres in active farmland. So again, you know, that's something we need to think about. Um, so those are all things that occurred to me as I was um, going through, you know, the recent uh, meetings that you've held without me. Um, but here is a list of uh, the things that we said we were going to be addressing in our solar bylaw, and I just wanted to quickly go over this. So um, what I've done is I, I took the outline that uh, we've been circulating for a while, and I went through it and um, <clears throat> reviewed what have we done and what still needs to be done. And so, um, you know, we've actually done quite a bit. What I've done is gone through the list and made uh, put a check mark and bolded the things that we at least have a pretty good draft of. So we have a pretty good draft of the purpose and of intent and intent of the bylaw. We have a pretty good draft of applicability and definitions, and those were kind of combined in one document. Um, the submittal requirements, we have very detailed requirements. <clears throat> we also have detailed dimensional requirements and design and performance standards. 
Um, and if Stephanie can scroll down a bit, um, we can see, I think on the second page, um, that we have monitoring, maintenance, and reporting requirements. Um, and those also include modifications to the solar array, transfer of ownership, abandonment and or decommissioning, financial security or surety, taxes or payment in lieu of taxes, severability and appeals. So we've actually done quite a bit. We have, you know, I would say probably a second or third draft of all of these sections that have been uh, checked off and bolded. So um, what I need to do is go back over them and put them kind of like in one uh, document and um, then probably bring it to you at your next meeting. But in addition to that, I'd like to um, you know, think about how do we want to uh, address this issue of using farmland for um, for solar, you know, and how detailed do we want to get in our uh, in our zoning bylaw about um, you know the specific detailed criteria. So that's that's my report for today, and I can send if people are interested, I can send them the latest drafts of all of those sections that I've checked off there, um, but I'll probably be updating them for the next time we meet. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> yeah. I think that um, gets us in good shape for sort of thinking about diving in um, next meeting. Uh, and I think this um, work with the uh, mapping that we're about to uh, uh, have presented to us will be really helpful for that as well. Uh, but yeah, these issues of, of farm uh, dealing with um, farms and forests <laughs> um, are, um, are are uh, still high on our list of, of, of uh, major issues that we need to um, come to uh, some consensus on and, and address. Okay, thank you for that. Um, any comments before we turn this over to Mike? Jack. Yeah. Um... So I just wanted to get, you know, clarification because I missed a couple of meetings, but um, with regard to, uh, you know, using like the wetland model, if you're using, uh, you know, farmland or, or, or forest that you're setting aside uh, some, some land for, I don't know if it's perpetuity or, or what, but that concept, you know, I'm kind of trying to get comfortable with. But I, uh, and I understand it for forests, but for farmland, I don't, I mean, because, uh, you know, we just had that presentation last week. I, I don't, uh, you know, the set aside concept for, for ag lands, I don't really, I'm not sure I'm on board with that. I don't understand it. I mean, I, you know, I, I uh, you know, requiring a farmer to have it or not. You know, allowing a farm to have it—it it, it seems like it's—it's—it's it's, it's not our business. I mean, w you know, we put in the dimensional sort of guidelines, but uh, it seems overreaching that with the way we're trying to control, you know, agricultural lands uh, within the bylaw. Um, just, just my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure whether Chris was suggesting we would have a. Um, requirement that is sim similar that we might have for forests that you have to set aside some forest somewhere else. I'm not sure if she was suggesting we would, um, or that she's thinking, um, or we, or, or it's open for discussion. Uh, you know, a, a farmer taking some farm land out of farming would need to replace that somehow elsewhere in the state. Um, but, um, yeah, any, uh, sorry, did I confuse you, Jack? No, but I, I guess I'm. I'm maybe Chris can just clarify what her notes were okay. with, on that because I, what I heard is, you know, may, maybe just explain that again, Chris. What you're, what you were thinking about for options. So I'm trying to get a handle on what this um, group is thinking about, and um, I've heard from some members of the group that they think that um, if you use farmland for um, for solar, then you need to incorporate agrivoltaics. And I'm asking myself the question, well, what if a farmer wants to have uh, solar on part of his farm and doesn't want to do agrivoltaics because it's too expensive or complicated or whatever? 
but yet he will continue to farm other parts of his farm. Um, and does he get any credit for that? Um, but I guess the first question is, are we going to require dual um, dual use agrivoltaics for farmers who want to take advantage of putting solar on their farms? So that's a question that I think this group needs to answer. And then, you know, are we going to have any kind of mitigation or, or trade-off? Um, and, and Jack, you've stated that you don't think that's the right approach. And I'm happy to take in your opinion about that. So I'm, I'm kind of looking for opinions about that from members of this group. And, I, and we did talk about having um, mitigation for, um, for removal of forests. So is that something that we want to apply to farms, farmland as well? I'm not saying I'm promoting that idea. I'm just looking for guidance from you all about what do you think about that? Dwayne, okay. I'm sorry. Me, I just want to remind you of the time. Exactly. Um, I was just going to say, let's let's um, um, raise these issues and, and and continue this discussion when we get to the uh, the next meeting and we start uh, discussing uh, what we want or comfortable with uh, in in uh, in the bylaw. Uh, so sorry uh, for those of you who still had your hand up, but our time is limited with uh, Mike, um, and uh, this is really uh, something we've all been looking forward to as well. So let me, um, I think Mike's addressed this group before, so I don't think I need to introduce him, And uh, but Mike Warner is um, uh, with the town, obviously, and the GIS um, coordinator or, or specialist. Or, Specialist, I was going to say guru, but uh, okay. He's uh, that too. <laughs> <laughs> all things GIS is Mike. So, uh, Mike, thank you for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. And You're for welcome. And you've done with this uh, mapping. Yeah, and it's nice to see you all again. Um, just a um, a quick refresher. Um, I work in the IT department here for the town. Um, I, you know, we support every uh, department here in town. Um, my title is applications manager, so I. GIS is one of those systems that I maintain and manage. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what my task was here was to take the data that GZA produced, uh, which was this 30 by 30 cell grid um, and score ranking, uh, feasibility ranking for uh, the entire town and to take that data and to load it into a web map that people could use to, to explore different areas around town. Um, I took a first crack at it um, and sent it to Stephanie for review. Um, it's really complicated. Uh, it's kind of hard to digest because it's so granular. Um, so feedback is welcome. Um, you know, reach out to what you see here today. It doesn't necessarily have to be the end product. Um, if there's certain things that you think would be more valuable, we can explore that. Um, so reach out to Stephanie and Dwayne, um, and they'll get in touch with me about different things. Um, have Have any of you has the link been shared around Stephanie? Have people other people seen it yet? No, not yet because um, you were still making some tweaks. So just I'm thought it was best. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Just thought it was best if you just started and then we could yeah. move forward from today. Okay. So what I'm going to show you guys, it's actually live to the the entire world can see it right now. Um, and uh, Stephanie or Dwayne will will pass this link around to all of you. Um, I'm constantly making tweaks to this, uh, um, so I will share my screen now. Okay, can you folks yep, see yep, this? Looks, looks good, Mike. Yep. Okay, all right. So it, when, it, when the link, when you first click on the link, there's a disclaimer that pops up that just tells people, hey, this isn't telling you where you're allowed to build solar in town. This is, this is the purpose of this, the, the map and it describes it um, in very brief detail. Um, and so when the map first loads, um, it zoomed in to the center of town. Amherst is a elongated shaped town. So when you zoom all the way out, it's really confusing. Um, so I started in the middle of town and um, I've grouped rankings of the cells together 
So scores three and two, which was low, um, are moderate to low feasibility. Scores five to four are yellow, are moderate feasibility. Scores seven and six are moderate to high feasibility and are a color of blue. And then scores nine and eight are high feasibility and are a color of dark purple. Um, and so when you get to this map, you can um, move around, you can zoom in. And once you start zooming in, parcels will pop up. The parcel polygons will pop up. Um, so if you're looking for a particular property in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little magnifying glass symbol. You can click here and you can type an address and you can um, click on that address and it will zoom you to there. Um, if, if you're really wanting to focus on a specific site, otherwise you can just kind of manually move yourself around. Um, and in the bottom right corner of the map, there's a, a dark square here. And if you click on that, aerial photography will load. So you can toggle back and forth between aerial photography and a base map that's more, um, you know, more traditional. Um, right beside of that square is going to be a key button. And I imagine something that we're gonna all wanna talk about um, is additional layers. Uh, because one of the big questions that I'm anticipating is, hey, why are there, why is a whole lot of town not have a color associated with it? And the answer to that is because GZA excluded those areas, these off-white or this whitish color, excluded those areas from the study. So they were not assigned a, a, a score. And those areas were not assigned to score for a bunch of different reasons. They're conservation land, they're APR land, they're institutional land, meaning Amherst College, UMass, or Hampshire College. Um, they're in the flood area, they're in the water polygon, you know, a lot of different options. And so what I've started doing here is if you click this little in the bottom right corner, let's see if I have a, a laser pointer here. Maybe I don't have it installed. But in the bottom right corner, you can click on this and you'll see some other layers that I have added in here. And when you, by default, they're all turned off so that you can just focus on the feasibility ranking. But you can come here and you can click on these little eyeball symbols and it will turn these layers on. So I just turned on APR land. And what that shows us is right here near the Fort River Conservation Area, these areas were excluded because they're in APR land. That's why these all of this land was not given a ranking. Um, and then once we start adding conservation restrictions and um, conservation areas and things like that, that's you start seeing areas get subtracted from the overall picture. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, and then Stephanie and Duane had mentioned that there was going to be some interest in um, maybe not layers that subtracted from GZA study, but layers that might just be interesting to kind of compare to this. So I've added prime farmland soils, um, which if you turn that on and you zoom out, pretty much the whole town is some classification of prime farmland soils. Um, and then I've also added a layer called vegetation cover. Um, and this is broken out into four different categories, trees, fields, crop, and brush. And this layer was developed from um, the April 2020 flyover that we had. Um, and so it's very, it's the most current um, coverage area that we that we have here in town. Um, and so you can you can turn on the aerial imagery and you can see if something is uh, covered in trees um, or you can you can look at this layer and kind of compare this as well. Um, and so I plan I'm actively working on this. I'm continuing to add different layers here. Um, institutional land, meaning the UMass properties, the Amherst College properties, 
that will be live later today. And then um, there are some layers from the state from MassGIS that I'm going to be loading in as well um, that were used to exclude some properties. So um, is there anything else that you want me to go over? I mean, it's, do we want to zoom around and look at things? It's, I didn't realize people hadn't taken a look at it yet. So I thought maybe there would be maybe some more questions about, about the product. Mike, the list of questions that Janet had posed, which, sorry, um, had I think 20 or so questions was mm -hmm. circulated to the group. Mm -hmm. um, okay, <clears throat> thank you, um, Mike, for that um, introduction and, and overview. That was um, really helpful. Um, let's see, uh, Janet. So this is just fantastic. And you know, I do I do remain confused between cropland and fields, but I think having this tool will help get rid of the confusion because I could think, oh, this is where they're saying there's a field, you know, it's hay or it's, you know, whatever. And but I, I would love to take a moment just to zoom around and look at the high scoring areas. Um, not too quickly because it's hard to see like the streets. Like I sure. I feel like I'm in an eye test. Oh but, yeah, do you want me to make you sick? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I would love to see. Like when I see all that purple, you know, I think right. oh, this could be the these this could be where we list as a priority on our priority list or priority map. And I just would love to just do a quick look that is detailed enough, um, slow enough that we don't get nauseous, and yeah. detailed enough that I could at least read a street name or something. So I'm gonna zoom out um, to the whole town to just show you really quickly, like if you just put your eyeballs on the whole town, look how much of it is whited out, right? Like the vast majority, of, <laughs> a lot of land is excluded. Um, and then down in the south near Bay Road, um, there's a lot of low scoring, low to moderate um, scoring areas. So there aren't a tremendous amount of high scoring Area, high feasibility scores eight, nine, and there were actually no properties. There were no 30 by 30 squares that received a score of 10 in town. Nine was the maximum. Um, so Janet, would you like to like maybe up here in North Amherst? Cause a lot of this stuff here is downtown is developed. So I imagine that that's more rooftop type stuff. Mm -hmm. So maybe up here in North Amherst where the other area of purple is, would that make sense? We'd love to look at the purple and what I see is aqua on my, um, right. but there's more aqua for sure. But I would love to, let's start looking at that little corner because I could at least think to myself, oh, I know what that is or. Right. So there, there were two errors in the data. Um, and I believe up here is going to be one of them. So this is 116 and this is Sunderland Road, like where Sunderland Road comes out to 116. I believe this is conservation land right across the street. I think it might be Mitchell Farm. Oh, in the in between the two conservation areas? I'm sort of guessing just from the, the sh but I think maybe not because the brook goes through his farm. Well, there's Podic Conservation Area and then there's Catherine Cole and there's a property in between the two. That might be Mitchell Farm. Which okay. I yeah, I, yeah, I've heard he has some solar on, but maybe, yeah. Let me turn on the imagery and zoom in there and see what's going on. Yep, it does look like a, sorry. No, it's interesting because this is kind of the gist of like what we need to understand. So here's the intersection. Um, coming up here is the intersection of uh, Sunderland Road and 116. So pretty directly across from that intersection, this farmland here got really, got you know, some of the highest scoring um, in town. Okay, that is not Mitchell Farm. Okay. Okay. Um, there was some, also some dark areas right up here, which that is actually the electrical <laughs> power station that's yeah. right up there and the field that's just to the south of that fire station. Um, I think that's Cole's land, yeah. And then if we scroll to the south, I 
So this is Meadow Street on the west side of 116, Russellville Road, all of these farms that are right in here. Um, the farmland is right here and also the property that, I forget what the name of the, the facility is that's here. Um, their property is ranked very highly. Okay. I think the rest of it is APR land because I know that's been a target for acquisition. Um, look. Well, I know a lot of this is flood zone as well. Uh -huh. um, which I have not added yet, but will be there shortly. Okay. Yep, you're right. I just turned on APR land. All of that. That's why all of that area is excluded from the study. Yeah. Um, regarding the aqua color, is there a particular area that you would like to take a look at? Um, Cause yeah, I mean, yeah, because it's kind of interesting. There's so much aqua there, and I'm wondering if it's in residential land or is it the apartment complexes? I mean, it's kind of good just to me. I don't know if it, I don't want to take all the time but just to focus on one area that we kind of know yeah just what we see if that makes sense yeah so a lot of the aqua that's in this general vicinity is like the apartment complexes and stuff that are here but then there is some vacant properties over here off of meadow street i believe these are yeah these are vacant and by the way when you zoom in um and the parcels turn on you can click with your mouse on the parcels and it will tell you the parcel number and who owns the parcel so you can click on those lands those parcels and then you can get the information about them is this a you know what is the land use here the the assessor's land use um, code um, so if you clicked on the like um i don't know the um so you could see what the land looks like i'm not making sense oh the aerial photo yeah like could we say oh that's farmland or just I'm kind of loving this tool, by the way. I'm loving that you're doing it because every time I try to use one of these tools, I just- It's hard. So in. that's, and Janet, that's exactly like, I. this data is really complicated. It's, um, we're wanting to add a lot of different layers to be able to turn on and, and inspect a lot of different things. And then navigating around can be clunky. So when you add all of those things together, people can get frustrated. So I wanted to, I wanted to start simple first uh -huh. and once people are comfortable with it okay let's let's think about okay this adding this data set would be really helpful for us um adding this would be really helpful for us now that we understand how to use it um and inspect things mm -hmm. um so these these two properties here look like they're vacant this is um what is the land use code mm -hmm. Can you, and, sorry, go ahead. Can you say what street names these are? Um, so this name? is, what is this? Is this, this is Meadow Street. It's Andrews Lavertier, those two properties that we're looking at right now. And they're kind of fallow. Much of it is um, in FPC, Flood Prone Conservancy District, which has very limited uses. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not really farmed. It's kind of just a field that gets mowed once in a while. Huh. Okay. That's, that stream is good for trout, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I shouldn't say that loudly because not a lot of people know that. But, but there's like a farm right across the street here. It's got a big barn. You know, their their property is has got a fairly a moderate to high feasibility score. Um, and this is Laskevitz. Um Let me just turn on like APR land. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sure. So once you turn on the APR land, you see why so much of this farmland on the in this general area, even though this general area seems to have pretty high scoring values, a lot of it is not usable because it's protect it's APR. Could, could you click on the farm, the prime farmland map? Because I think this is the great yep. stuff. That's so when you click on again, when you click on prime farmland, a lot of stuff. Actually, it's kind of wild that in this area, it's. And what's, what's to be clear, this prime farmland area is not something that we develop in in town. It is a USDA layer that the state hosts, and we grab from the state. So this is not my data. <laughs> what, are, um, what is it? What are the different colors? I see kind of an olive, and then a. Yeah. So in. So that's a great question. So watch over here on the left-hand side, um, 
this oh. is kind of the legend. Okay, so as you turn layers on and off, over here on the left-hand side of the page, the legend will dynamically build itself. So when you turn farmland, farmland soils, the dark green mm -hmm. are, is what the USDA classified as all areas are prime farmland. The slightly lighter shade is farmland of statewide importance, and the lightest shade is farmland of unique importance. I do not know the difference between the three. <laughs> I, um, I did look, Mike, and well, I, I noticed that there wasn't any, actually, there wasn't any land that was farmland of unique importance. Oh, okay. Uh, I clicked that on and off. I didn't see any change. So okay. I, think, I think all the light color is the farmland of statewide importance. Gotcha. I think unique might be like locally, locally valued. Locally defined. Yeah, I think yeah. I think so, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Huh. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, but if we just, um, I'm just gonna make you sick here. Um, but if you zoom out to all of town, a lot of town um, is covered. Yeah. And, and and there there's a lot of land that's of, of uh, prime prime soils that's not farmed. Yes. <laughs> right. right. A lot of our right. forests and a lot of our housing uh, is in that area. Right. All right, Dan, do you have it? Yeah, hey, Mike, um, is this uh, the underlying data for the solar feasibility ranking? I'm, I'm assuming it's a raster file. Is that available for the public? Um, um, it, is a raster, it is a raster file. I converted it to... Um, the shape. I converted it to a polygon shape and then yeah. merged all of the merged this the cells together um, mm -hmm. so that it would draw faster in the web map because um, mm -hmm. it was just so slow otherwise. Right. So and what what that means is it's um, I know you know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I really, but, my, my, my real, my real question is, yeah. is, is the data, is the actual data available to the public to um, access or yes, can it, we it's, access it through this dashboard? Nope. I will put it on our open data site and I will let you know when it's live. Okay, um, great. Yeah. Wonderful. Yep. Yep. Um, I mean, all of our data is publicly available data. There, there are very few layers in town that require like special approval to re retrieve um but everything is technically public data so yeah. i will i will publish would you like the the original raster file or i mean just either i just think it's good to have that available for the public to use okay so um, this my shape layer is publicly available it is um available in arcgis online um to grab and i can share that link with folks um, for those of you who know how to grab it and pull it into your GIS program. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and then is, is there like a, a references section somewhere where, where you can just say where all these data sources are coming from? So um, yeah, I can do that. Uh, I can put that together somewhere and link it here. Yeah, um, I would appreciate that too. Yeah, most of this data is ours. There are going to be a few layers that are basically sourced, pulled from MassGIS. And as you know, MassGIS is an aggregator of data themselves. So people mm -hmm. think that, oh, we're grabbing MassGIS data when MassGIS is hosting FEMA data or they're hosting USDA data or DNR, you know, data. So um, yeah, I'll grab, I'll grab that. That's a great point. Um, let me just make a note of that. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, I have two questions, Mike. Sure. One of them is, is there, or can you superimpose like the zoning map over this? Yep. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Yep. That is something that is, um, I'll just make a note to remember to do that. Um, Great. Because that, that would be helpful. Because um, I know Jack was interested in um, the um, open space and recreation plan too. Yep. Which I think is and then in terms can, can of I just ask the clarifying question on that, uh, Janet, sorry, since I don't know exactly what that meant, uh, but would that mean that the the zoning and Mike, would that mean that the 
zoning layer would show up as one of the one an additional layer here uh, from yes. the set of menus. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, but I will warn you. <laughs> your eyes will want to fall out <laughs> because the zoning when the I th the raster is uh, or the solar feasibility layer is you know can be difficult to look at on its own and then when you add the zoning it gets because you don't only have zoning but then you have the zoning overlays so you're you're kind of will be, you'll be looking at almost three things all at one time and it can be hard on your eyes um so and then a question, a question mike in terms of updating so like since um you know we bought hickory ridge and i think it's i'm not sure if it's under conservation restriction or not um but you know if if we have added apr land or um i know there's been new wetlands delineations and stuff like that like is there a way to add that or do we just have to keep that in our heads as we look at parcels so i update um layers all the time um whenever I, I feel like we need a better workflow internally here in town for me being notified when land turns to apr land i think that's something chris and i have talked about in the past i know dave zomek and i have talked about in the past sometimes it'll be years that hey this land is apr land and dave will give me a list and i you know and i'll make it happen um but if i it, let's say let's say a property is changed into APR land last week and I get notified of it and I make that change in my database, it will be live on this site instantly. Um, so this is not, these layers are dynamic. They're always updating whenever I update data. So for example, let's pretend this is Brandywine Apartments right here in the middle with a pond. Let's say this parcel gets subdivided, um, gets split in two, if I make that change today, you're going to see that change in this layer immediately, and you're going to see the new ownership immediately um, in the data. It's interesting because we have those A and Rs all the time, and then what you know that happens. And then you know, I, I keep I was thinking about wetlands delineations. Nothing's that big, but I could think of like three or four projects, you know, that we the planning board has looked at, or I know this mm -hmm. has done. And I'm just, but I think you know. I don't think there's any massive change in the wetland stuff, Chris, unless Chris <laughs> knows so, this stuff. So I would like to say something about that, and maybe yeah. it's partly a question, but my understanding is that we don't map all of the wetlands on this GIS system. Wetlands are mapped as projects are proposed, as landowners come to us and say, we want to do X on our property. And then we say, oh, you have to go to the Conservation Commission. You have to map your wetlands and get the mapping approved by the Conservation Commission. But I'm not sure that there's a mechanism by which the Conservation Commission or department sends that information to Mike and asks that to be mapped. I don't think that happens, but Mike, that that's is a correct. question for you. That, okay. is, that is correct, Chris uh, and Janet. Uh, just, oh. I, I do not... Um, I've, I've never, and I don't even think my predecessor updated um, the delineation of wetlands in in town in a layer, um, and I've I haven't done that in my six years here either. Um, I can add um, some information to this yeah, too, which is that delineations are good for three years, mm -hmm. so they're legally only good for three years, and then they have to be re-examined again. So it's always changing. Um, and that's why there's no one definitive map. It just doesn't exist. Mike, would you want that information? Um, I mean, I don't know, just personally, professionally, <laughs> for your maps. I mean, I understand the value of it. Uh, it would be probably be a lot of work. <laughs> so, so yes and no. Um, so we, um, so we could be looking at the map and not realize, oh, a wetland was delineated on this, you know, like Mickey's like land or, um, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking like Fearing Street. I could think right. of like projects. So, it, so we may not even know what we're looking at. Right. So, Janet, I can I can tell you. Um, so are, I don't know how familiar many of you are. There's a little bit of background noise. Does anyone know who that is? Sorry, it's me. Okay, um, so 
I don't know how familiar many of you are with Amherst Maps, our, our GIS uh, parcel viewer um, that uh, we refer people to go to to access their property cards or look at the interactive zoning map. Or, um, But there is a layer, it's embedded in that map, um, and it's from the 2009 flyover when they flew the town they captured new aerial photography they drew every building every sidewalk every piece of road paint <laughs> um, painted line and as part of that they captured what they saw in the imagery as wetlands okay and my predecessor took those layers and he mashed them all together and he made this nice beautiful it's called a base a, a base map. He made this nice, beautiful base map. The amount of calls that we receive and people just doing work because they see those wetland layers on that that base map and they think, oh, my home here, it's not in the wetlands. I'm just going to start work because I looked at this Amherst Maps page and I'm just going to start building my deck. <laughs> when in, and then the town finds out about it and there actually is wetlands there and they needed to have that study done. So it, it can cause more problems um, than you'd expect to, to have the wetland stuff up and live. Um, but I'm I'm truly not an expert on this. We have someone in our conservation department who's who really knows a lot more about it than I do. Um, her name is Erin Jock. Um, but I know that it has been a big pain point for us. Okay, and it will certainly have. I mean, we do have some draft rules around wetlands, um, and um, <clears throat> and obviously there for any solar project of significance, there would be a wetland determination um, that's uh, part of that siting. Um, effort. Um, so I'm not sure if we need need that on a parcel by parcel basis for the purpose of of uh, the the bylaw uh, work. But Jack, yeah, I was just going to say that you know what what Janet is saying is uh, you know wetlands are, are very you know it's site specific, and then you you start linking different studies of adjacent parcels and it, it gets unwieldy and again people are relying on it like Mike was saying because it's on the map and they get into trouble so it's something I, I understand why the town would not go down that road but I'm just thinking that certain parcels could be tagged uh like you know a little pop-up to refer to a a file or or plan right. submittal that's true that could come up separately and that that'd probably be the best you know, you know, without too much work on your end, Mike, uh, best way to kind of link actual on the ground field studies to a GIS, you know. That, that um, is actually, that is a good point. We would probably just need to find a way to, because um, like what Stephanie said is those plan that that expires after three years, we, we would have to like, maybe find a way to make them kind of disappear after their three year, um, because uh, it, it's no longer valid after three years, is if, if what I'm understanding from Stephanie is correct. Um, so it's something we can absolutely discuss internally because that is totally doable. Um, and I like that idea better, like tagging the parcel and flagging it in a way, and then you click on the parcel and you can see the plan. I like that in better than actually drawing the boundary on the map because that's going to drawing the boundary on the map. People are going to think it's definitive and it's going to cause so much headache. All right, Stephanie. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think you need to be careful too, because in linking files and applications, there might be an application for a determination, but it may not yield anything relevant. So, I mean, I don't know how much you get. It would be probably more helpful, but I again, I think the wetland boundaries are always changing, and I don't think that there's a way to just map them all over town. And even if you link them to a file, even the file might only indicate that there was an application, but it doesn't necessarily yield results of a wetland delineation. And the other thing I would want to say is that, um, you know, I think because it is unwieldy and because it's always changing, I 
I don't think it's a definitive layer and there is already a process for identifying wetlands. So if a solar application comes in, it has to go before the Com Conservation Commission um, because they'll wanna look to see if there are wetlands. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll definitely be, you know, like we do with any project in town. If there are potentially wetlands, they'll have to be examined. Um, and other departments, um, have noted when there are wetlands that we might not necessarily have them mapped, but it might come before the inspections department and they might notice on a field check that there will be wetlands and they might then notify Aaron. So there is a process that happens for that. And I don't know that, I don't know how you want to include that in the solar bylaw. Like it, it feels a little overarching to some degree to me. Good, thanks. All right, uh, Janet. So, so in terms of like a pop up, you know, if there was a wetlands delineation, could the pop up just say wetlands found on this parcel in 2020 or something um, without saying exactly where? Because, you know, I think what would be useful that information, hey, if someone's buying land, but also it'd be useful to us if we're saying, oh, this is a prior, if we, you know, if we decide to do a zoning overlay or we're picking the priority sites. And it, you know, we're just looking at this map and it turns out most of that site or a good portion has wetlands on it. Um, it's not a great site, you know, and so I, I do think that information would be useful. I know, I know wetlands, you know, the, their sh shape and size can change. I'm not sure that many really sort of disappear, but I think it would be useful to say in 2020 wetlands were found on this site um, or in 20, you know, 1985 or something like that. So Chances are it's probably still there. It may have changed form. You know, I've seen like in Hopbrook near my house how that happens. Um, like there's vegetation cover. It has completely changed in 20 years, but it's still really wet, you know, and stuff like that. So I, I do think it would be useful because um, it's information we have. And I, I hate to just rely on like, oh, did this department know this was happening or did does this? But I just, I don't know. It just seems like what Jack was suggesting made sense to me. But I understand you don't want to map it so people think, oh, this is definitive and I can do whatever I want. All right, great. Uh, Chris? Um, how do we get to this map? Is Stephanie going to send us a link? to this or is there a place on the website where we can find this and look at it ourselves? How do we access this map? I was going to send you a link, but Mike, isn't there a way to have this come up as one of the layer options when we go to when someone goes to maps? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. No, I think we should link out to it um, um, until we we're happy with everything we see. Um, so I think we should, you know, if we want to put a link on, I don't know if there's a web page for this group um, or on the conservation page somewhere, we link to it. But um, Stephanie, you can also email it around to everyone. Yeah, I, I will um, email the link to both the ECAC and to this group. I think we could probably put it on the Engage Amherst mm -hmm. site as well. and. Um, I, I can sort of talk with Brianna about how to best get that on the website. Right. right. And Mike, Mike, I guess I had a question as I was sort of playing with, with the mm -hmm. app and trying to, or, um, uh, you know, sort of discriminate between, uh, really trying to discriminate between the solar sites that have, you know, uh, moderate, uh, moderate to high or high feasibility, the, the aqua and the purple, mm -hmm. um, and try to, to sort of quickly get a sense of how much of that is in real, it really is in residential mm -hmm. areas where it's sort of uh, acre or less uh, lots and, and there's a house there and, and so forth. <clears throat> um, and, and areas that are um, more open. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was looking at the vegetation cover Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe as one, and maybe the zoning layers will do this, but I, I suspect even some of this, these areas that are pretty open are still residentially zoned. Uh, I don't, I don't know, uh, but I'm wondering um, if you might sort of walk us through that in terms of how we might look at that. Maybe um, 
uh, I was looking at the vegetation cover and it seemed like for most of the areas that are really uh, are more more residential neighborhoods, they tend to have no vegetation cover. Uh, and maybe that's a way to recognize that. And it's mainly the forest and the fields that show up. Uh, but um, might you sort of just scroll out in the map and sort of maybe take click the vegetation cover on and off and see yeah. what we can glean from that? Yeah. So we're in North Amherst right now. This is yeah, um, okay. East Pleasant Street coming up to Pine Street. Um, yeah, yeah. And and 116 is over here and 63. So yeah. Cushman is the general area that we're looking at. So a lot of residential neighborhoods up here and then, you know, Puffer's Pond. Yeah, okay. Um, a lot of, you know, if I turn on APR land. Um, I'm sorry, what are, what are we looking at? I'm, I'm a little. Well, I was just trying to get a sense of, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of feasible areas, solar feasible in the uh, aqua color. But it's, um, but, but it's like small parcels that are basically have homes, you know, yeah, residential homes on them. So, so I think Dwayne's looking for bigger sites. Yeah, and it, yeah, a way to sort of have a, a a good handle using this map of where are our that's you know more of our concern I guess for this zoning is where are there potential projects that are 250 kilowatts and above, uh, which would not be really any of our residential neighborhood type of properties, uh, though they predominate to some extent on this solar feasibility map. Yeah. So there's a there's a couple. Let me think about that a little bit, Dwayne. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different ways that we could maybe instead of trying to superimpose things on top of each other and turning things on and off, there's there's other ways that we could maybe um, accomplish that. Um, but it that comes, I would say that that comes, you know, that's more of like an analytical. Um, phase um and but it's definitely something that can be done with gis in-house pretty pro pretty programmatically mm -hmm. um where we could we could basically divide this stuff up into you know whether you're talking about zoning res, zoning areas or the, the the code of the parcel itself and kind of find areas um, yeah i mean like a a, a a map that would show the solar feasibility uh but be able to turn it on and off for eight, for parcels that are over say two acres. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, might might be helpful. Oh, that would be super easy. I I mm -hmm. can actually do that pretty quickly. Um, create a create a layer basically of these parcels that are greater than two acres and just have it as something that you could turn on and turn off. That's yeah, that's very okay. simple. I mean, two fifty kilowatts would be uh, that would be um, about an acre, an acre or two acres. A, a two acres would probably be good. Two acres? Okay. I'm open to other opinions. <laughs> that sounds good. Are me. you thinking an acre of panels or just you need one acre to get enough panels on with some setback? Well, with setbacks, I think you need two acres probably to get 250 kilowatts. Okay. Dwayne, I don't know if you can see Martha's hand, but she's had it. Oh, up sorry, for a while. no. Okay. Oh, well, I can, uh, but I wasn't looking that way. Uh, I have my the the map. I need on my big screen. So go ahead, Martha. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. Could you scroll over toward the northeast corner toward Atkins Reservoir and let yeah. us see what's what's near what's near the shore? There? Okay. Yeah there so this is market hill road um we have flat hills road running north to south and this is high point drive overlook drive right in here is this the general area you're looking at or are you yes, looking yes okay. thank you and so as far as i know it's sort of residential and 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 forested is that right or if i turn on vegetation cover that dark green is forest <laughs> so yeah uh -huh. 
but then yeah. it, then then it's residential. I mean, it's it's along the roads, yeah. Residential, yeah, and the fight is still within Amherst, but it's uh, excluded for some reason. Excluded yeah. probably because of the Atkins it drains to the Atkins Reservoir, or it could be. You probably picked one of the ones that I don't have. Okay. Uh, I don't have loaded yet. So that's that's one thing that now that we're getting more comfortable with it, what I'm doing is kind of behind the scenes is this mm -hmm. list is going to become longer and longer and longer because I'm going to be <laughs> adding all the different things that GZA used to hide things so that when you're zooming around and you're like, wait, why is this, why is this not have a color? Why is this not have a score? You'll see why. Um, but let me see. So, so cider so, mill pond, but I don't know exactly why this one is is whited out at the moment. So the pink and yellow sections could be slow, or no. They, they can they also can. be distance from transmission lines or distribution lines. Yeah, yeah I'm looking at those big piece, big chunk, big lots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's most like it's probably a combination of all of those things. There is a zoning district that surrounds Atkins Reservoir. It's called the Watershed Protection District, and it really limits the types of things that can go on within a certain distance of, um, of that uh, body of water. And I don't know if Mike has the capability of bringing up the zoning map, but in any event, you all can go on the zoning map on the website and look at that particular location, the Watershed Protection District, which is, this is the only area in town that has mm -hmm. that. And it's yeah. right, right around that western portion of the Atkins Reservoir. I think that is a lot of that whited out area. Yeah, I, I, I will get that zoning layer and I will throw it in here. It'll be another layer that you can turn it off and you'll be able to see that. Um, that's on my list of to do's. OK. All right. Um, this has been great, Mike. Uh, any any other thoughts, Mike, or any other questions? Well, so I, I would say that if anybody has any questions or um, you know enhancement ideas or anything like that, you know, reach out to Dwayne, reach out to Stephanie, and um, you know, talk to them, and they'll relay a message to me. And if if you guys need me to jump back on another meeting and talk to you or explain something. Just reach out, okay? Oh, Jack's got his hand yeah, up. Yeah, I see that. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, this isn't necessarily for Mike, but uh, with regard to the uh, APR land, which um, we're excluding here, but um, you know they they can have they can have their solar for on site. Yeah. But it has to be limited to their on site use. But is there a situation where there's a large enough, you know, farm that it comes up and meets our our threshold, uh, you know, and so that are are we are we addressing that type of, you know, agricultural or excuse me, uh, dual use kind of or you know, it doesn't have to be dual use, but <laughs> are we addressing that kind of solar development within our bylaws or not? Yeah, I guess remind me, uh, APR lands were excluded from the solar feasibility mapping? APR lands were excluded and um, they farmers whose land is in APR can have up to 200% of the solar or the, of the electricity usage that they would use. So unless they have some kind of a big operation that uses a lot of electricity, they're not, really not going to be able to have a very big solar array on their property. It would involve, you know, probably multiple buildings and multiple things that are drawing on electricity. So they can have, you know, the, the, the solar array that would meet their own needs, and then they can have one time again as much as that. So in other words, 200% of what they would be using themselves. And that's a state regulation. Yeah, so we will 
um, need to address that in our, it's not on our map so much, but we would need to address that in our regulations with regard to if we wanted it, to put anything in our zoning bylaw that uh, um, restricts that further or, or allows for that. I don't think we need to put anything in our zoning bylaw about APR land because it is strictly regulated by the state. Yeah. So can I, my, can I jump in? Yeah. I think what Jack is saying is, will there be, um, could there be um, solar arrays on APR land that are bigger than 250 kilowatts that would come inside the bylaw? So we'd be saying, oh, you have to place it here or there or whatever. That's, is that, is that Jack? Have, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. If they have a large enough load, I suspect so. But I think what Chris was saying, it's maybe unlikely, uh, depending on the type of farms, the electric demands within the farm. Okay. Um, great. Um, we're just at, um, getting on time with with uh, with Mike and so any final thoughts for for Mike before we um, thank him and bid him farewell. <laughs> <laughs> all right let me let me just say Mike thank you for all this uh, really excellent work it really going to be helpful for us uh, exciting to see and and your willingness to um, work with us um, has, has been great so appreciate that and yes we will um, gather information from the group um, and and uh, send that to you uh, via uh, via Stephanie. That sounds great. And like I like I mentioned, I'm the way my brain kind of works. Um, I'm a good. I can read maps, <laughs> but I know not everyone can. I've been working in this field long enough, so I always build maps simply first. Try to make them simple, and sometimes even the because the underlying data is just complicated. Even the most simple maps are complicated and hard to read. Um, so that's why I would encourage you, you folks to get in there now. Um, you know, once you've received this link from Stephanie, get in there now and start experimenting with it and playing around before too many things get added to it. And it just becomes really difficult to understand. So um, yeah. I, I, I did have one just logistical question with regard to the mapping when I was playing with it. Um, can you can a user control which um, which symbol is in front of the other symbol? <laughs> uh, you know, so, um, you know I what can, I mean. So sometimes yeah. I want to see the the solar parcels, but then they go away because the land cover covers it over. But I'd like to see the um, potentially see the the uh, solar right. visibility on top of the. Yeah, uh, I think I can do that. I'll probably need to rebuild it a little bit, but that's, I'll look into that, Dwayne. Um, yep, okay. Just rearranging the layers. Yep, uh, it should be possible, but um, okay. let me see what I can do. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much, Mike. Um, and uh, uh, we'll be in touch. Okay, sounds thank good, you folks. Yep, see thank ya. you. Thanks, Mike. Bye. All right. <clears throat> All right, thanks everybody for uh, for that, and uh, yeah, very useful to have that mapping available to us, and uh, it'll continue to sort of grow for uh, our purposes and the, and the towns uh, even when we're done. <clears throat> so, um, okay, great. So we have about fifteen minutes left. Um, we wanted to uh, talk briefly about the next meeting. The next meeting is scheduled for July. Getting into July, July 7th, uh, similar time. Um, hopefully that works for at least a quorum and for everybody. Um, and look forward to that. So the agenda there will work work on, but you know, we're 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 officially into summer. Um, and um uh I think. Chris's outline and and sort of status of where we are with the with the um, bylaw was helpful. Uh, I think we do really need to focus attention uh, and conversation uh, beginning next meeting on these issues with regard to farmland and forest, uh, so that um, Chris can have a good sense of where 
we all want to go with regard to that to develop that into the into the uh, into the drafting. Uh, so in my mind, um, those will be sort of the uh, two areas to start discussion on. Um, uh, the, uh, maybe a revisit of where we sit, where we what we put together so far for forests, uh, and then and then talk about farmland um, uh, at the next meeting. Does that sound okay with folks? Good. Okay. Um, all right. Let me, um, uh, Janet, please, and then we'll move on. Um, I think it's a great idea. I, I have like a, I don't know where to, this fits, but I, um, I've been having trouble finding things. And I, I, you know, with this mapping coming online, I think we urgently have to set up some kind of, um, you know, I would put it on our solar bylaw working group page, but maybe we can just put it on a solar bylaw page on the town thing with, um, you know, the different state and the town plan, this mapping thing, you know, good articles or something, because I, I just don't think there's a central place to find information. And I struggle, we've had a lot of really good articles and pieces of information, and I've been struggling and like, I have to go back and search through the agenda to see, you know, what the, what the things were for, um, you know, what, what the attachments were. And it, and as, you know, I feel like if I live through this process and I have trouble finding things, I think that members of the public or the, you know, planning board or the town counselors who want to see stuff, you know, so maybe the, the, you know, GZA report, the Cadmus report, the Nietzsche report, like there's some really big pieces of information that should be all in one spot. And I know that I'm actually saying work for Stephanie when I saw that hand go up, but I really do think we need to have one, one-stop shopping somewhere. And I'm not sure that um, the, whatever, something engage Amherst is a good spot. I, I don't think that's going to, people are intuitively not going to understand that. And then the other thing is like, Chris, can we stitch together our bylaw sections, like using that outline and I don't care if there's big gaps or, you know, questions in it, because I'm just lost. And I have I have it stitched together in pieces of paper with my notes and changes, but I just have lost the whole sense of where, what the bylaw looks like. So I would love the skeleton with some parts and meat and stuff. So that would be super helpful to me. Those are my two pleas. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. So there already is a resources folder that things were going into. Um, I have to update it, but that's where um, sources of information like studies and bylaws and information like that was all in one folder. It is a lot to go through and it will be even more to go through, but that is the one stop and that's on your solar bylaw working group page. There's a link to resources. So there is a folder there. So that's where everything should go. And I'll add to it. I'll just make sure the studies are there as well. I don't know that. Um, I think we should, I, th I think that's not, I think it's not a helpful to the public and we need to cull stuff out of there's all this tracer lane decisions and things like that. Like the tracer lane decision is important, but like six land court. So I don't, you know, like I, we can't have like 40 documents and say, oh, good luck reading this. I think we should really have a spot where the public or the town council or planning board can go and say, oh, I want to go for a deeper look, but I don't want to like swim through it. So I know, I know, I mean, I thought that actually GZA was going to do some kind of website for the public, but no, know that was never part of what they were. Well, let's leave, let's leave that to Stephanie in terms of her, um, uh, all the other work she has to do and her sort yeah. of discretion of what, what would be most helpful to the, um, town and the town towns folks. I don't want to, um, overburden her with, with, um, organizational, needs uh but point point taken Dwayne, what i will ask is janet if you want to just give me a list of the things that you're specifically oh. referring to okay. maybe what i could do is put a subfolder in but i don't think I, they're going to live in the resources folder but maybe what i could do is like a subfolder <laughs> of broken down into like studies bylaws reports or something like that so if you just send me the list of the things you're referring to i can try to at least organize that piece okay good thanks all right, great. Um, that brings us to um, uh, uh, public comments. And um, I do wanna hear from anybody uh, who's in our attendees. Uh, we do have three uh, people from uh, attending at this point. I think there were about five or so earlier, uh, but are there any 
uh, attendees who would like to make a comment at this point. All right, I'm not seeing any. Stephanie, do you see anything I don't see? <laughs> I don't think you do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, super. Okay, but thank you um, all for uh, joining us today. Um, um, all right. And um, any last words or thoughts or questions before we uh, seek to adjourn? A little, ten, 10 minutes to spare. Joanne, I just wanted to very quickly say that we had three members of the public attend today. I know that often comes up. Yep. Okay. So I think there are a couple more earlier, Stephanie, but um, that I saw, but we'll say, we'll say three at the official time of public comments. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, well, very good. Um, all right. I have a, um, a great weekend and um, beginning of summer, July 4th, and we'll see you on the other side. Um, on July 7th um, and, uh, and and get to work on, on more bylaws. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.